everybody, it's Dr. Alex Earl. We're here at Pure Plastic Surgery today, and it's hump day with Dr. Alex Earl. Uh, and we are really excited because we're getting everything together uh, to open up uh, once again. So as you all uh, probably know by now, uh, May 10th is gonna be our, uh, basically our go live date. That's uh, when surgery is happening again here at Pure. Uh, so we're getting everything all set up and we're super excited. All right, so um, today the topic is going to be tummy tuck, okay? So I wanted to kind of do a comprehensive overview of tummy tuck. Uh, so we'll talk about everything from, um, you know, pre-op, op, post-op complications and things of that nature, all right? Um, and so then after that, we'll, we'll be happy to answer, you know, a whole bunch of questions. Uh, we can focus them on tummy tuck as well, uh, but we're able, you know, willing to take uh, any other questions that you may have. now. Um, before we get started, I did want to clear up one thing because we got we had a lot of patients um, ask us, and I, I'm pretty sure, I thought I had answered it last last week. Uh, but anyway, just to be clear, uh, a lot of patients have asked, you know, is the staff getting tested? And the answer is absolutely yes. Uh, the staff is getting tested. They're all getting tested uh, uh, basically now before we open up, and then we were going to continue staff testing every two weeks, and then of course we're going to have our daily staff temperature checks okay so yes so of course it's very important for the staff to be covid free as well uh and so we're taking all the measures necessary to do so all right all right so let's uh dive in so uh we're, today we're talking about tummy tuck tummy tuck uh has other names you know the the official name is abdominoplasty okay so uh tummy tuck and abdominoplasty is the same thing all right uh and you know, the pre-op for the tummy tuck is very, very similar to kind of most surgeries where you have general anesthesia. Uh, the new things that we're doing, of course, are all the COVID-19 related things, which includes the testing and everything else. And of course, I dove into that last week. Uh, so if you guys want to look at all the details, uh, you can go into our IGTV, pop up that video and check out everything that we're doing uh, to maintain pure COVID-19 free. Okay, so I'm not going to get into a lot of detail into that today uh, because we did that last week, but it's up there for you to see at any time. All right, uh, but then in general, of course, you got to do your labs. Okay, so we have to do your CBC, which includes your hemoglobin level, which is very important, uh, and your platelets as well. Uh, then we do your electrolytes, uh, typically called a CMP or a complete metabolic profile. Uh, we then do what is called your coag, your coag. So there's there's two of them. One's the PTINR, that's one test. And then you have your PTT, uh, which is a separate test, okay? Uh, so you have your PTINR and your PTT. Um, and then we always check your HIV, we check your, your pregnancy status as well. And like we said, we're gonna check, be checking your COVID PCR within 72 hours of surgery, all right? So all those labs uh, have to be done. Uh, if uh, everyone gets an EKG, okay, regardless of age and health status, uh, we like to do EKGs for all our patients. Okay, not everyone gets the chest x-ray, all right? If you're over 40, uh, you'll get a chest x-ray. If you had, uh, you know, asthma or some sort of prior lung issue, uh, you'll get a chest x-ray, uh, sleep apnea as well. Uh, but not, that's not for everyone. If you're 25 years old, you've had two babies and you're and you know, absolutely in perfect health, uh, there's no need for a chest x-ray for you, okay? Typically labs have to do be done within 30 days of surgery. Of course, we've changed that a little bit now with the current situation and the difficulty in getting labs, but that, you know, that's the usual case. That's the usual case. However, EKGs and chest x-rays can last up to six months. Uh, so that's, that's not a problem there. Okay, so provided everything there is, is good, then uh, we are able to do the surgery. So what are the different types of tummy tucks? Okay, so we go from, from small to large basically all right there's the mini tummy tuck all right a lot of people want the mini tummy tummy tuck because they feel like it's less invasive smaller scar etc the problem is that most patients do not qualify for a mini tummy tuck okay so what is the mini tummy tuck well actually the incision is not that short the incision is still longer than a c-section incision um, it still goes pretty close to about hip to hip but the anterior hip the anterior hip area not going around okay um, but what makes it mini is that you're typically undermining just to the belly button or perhaps just past the belly button, but you're not doing a huge undermining all the way to the sideboard process. The other thing you don't do with the mini is you don't do the, the plication. You typically don't do a plication with that. And it's really for patients that are, um, already have pretty good skin, you know, above the belly button and all they have is just that little bit 
a loose skin just below the belly button that kind of remained perhaps after their C-section or something like that. But otherwise, you know, they have no skin laxity or minimal skin laxity above the belly button, okay? So those are the patients that qualify for a mini, a mini tummy tuck. And, and to be honest, it's, it's a small population of our, uh, our patients. If you okay? have fibroids, can you qualify for a mini tummy tuck? So yeah, so if having or not having fibroids, uh, you know, it doesn't depend on that. Um, fibroids are okay. Uh, so like I said, it really depends on the fact that you gotta have pretty good skin quality overall, uh, especially above the belly button, uh, that you don't have a muscle separation, and that really all we're addressing is that little kind of small pouch uh, just below the belly button there, okay? All right, so that's the mini. The next is the standard tummy tuck. That's what we do most of the time, okay? So most of the time, your standard tummy tuck, that incision goes, yes, it does go across all the way kick to kick. We do keep it low so it's easy to hide in your clothing in your swimsuit. It does have that little scar around the belly button because we have to create a new opening for the belly button to come out, okay? And it does include that, uh, what we call the, the plication or in layman's terms, the muscle repair, all right? Uh, and then it does include the one liter here in Florida, one liter of lipo suction, okay? So in Florida, we are limited by the Department of Health to as, how, as to how much liposuction we can do uh, once we make an incision such as a tummy tuck and that limit is one liter, okay? So that's the amount of liposuction that we can do. We typically focus that on the flanks and the waist area to try to give you a bit more of an hourglass shape uh, with your tummy tuck. Okay? Is this process different for men or women? Um, it's very, very similar. Very similar for men and women. So the surgical technique doesn't change that much, but yeah, how aggressive we are with the waist uh, will change because in men, typically men don't want an hourglass shape. You know, that's not the, the male physique or the male shape. So we're more aggressive with trying to create that hourglass with females, with women, um, and not so much with men. Okay? All right. Um, and then we go into the extended tummy tuck. Okay? So the extended tummy tuck is when we're really kind of going around the corner. So we're going around the corner as far back as we can go to where we, uh, basically where we can see as the patient is laying on the table face up, okay? Sometimes we do have to prop them up a little bit and we need to go a little bit further back as well. So with the extended tummy tuck, we're definitely, we're going around the corner towards the back, okay? That's the extended tummy tuck, that's for people, typically massive weight loss patients um, who, who have, you know, loose skin that goes around and uh, they have, you know, a, a significant amount of excess skin. And so for those patients, we gotta do the extended tummy tuck. The other parts remain the same. We still do the muscle repair. Uh, we still do the liposuction uh, to the flanks and the waist. Can All you right? get the tummy tuck with a lipo 360? So, like I just said, so for most patients you cannot because of that limit to the liposuction, which is one liter. So, you know, typically a lot, you know, I would say the majority of patients will have that one liter of fat just in their flanks and their waist. So, you know, if we are doing that, turning people around and doing all that, we'll be way above the, uh, the limit here given to us by the Department of Health. Okay? Now, I, for me, um, I do, I use drains for my tummy tuck. So it's two drains, okay? They come out of the corners of the incision. Um, and I usually leave them in anywhere between, it can be anywhere between seven to 14 days, okay? That's the average. The average is about seven to 10 days or so. For most patients, especially our patients that come out of town, will be able to remove one of the drains, but they may have to go home with one of the drains. So for all the tummy tuck patients out there that are coming to us from out of town, uh, you want to be sure that you, that you think about this uh, ahead of time, okay? That you've identified someone at home that's gonna be willing and able to remove that drain for you when it's ready, okay? It doesn't necessarily have to be an MD. It can be a nurse, it can be a physician assistant, it can be uh, you know, a nursing assistant. It, can be, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be a, a doctor, okay? But you wanna think about that ahead of time. You do not want to go to the ER or the urgent care to remove a drain, okay? Why? They get upset and a lot of times they don't even do it, so you just wasted your time, you wasted your money, and, and, and then they get upset and sometimes they even give us like nasty calls, which I don't know why, but that's something they do. So, do not plan on going to the ER or the urgent care to remove your drain. Have a plan as to who will remove your drain when you get home. Okay? Alright. Good. So that's the operative, uh, so, oh, the people ask, is it general anesthesia? Yes, it's general anesthesia. How long does it take? If we're just doing a tummy tuck by itself, nothing else, uh, typically an hour and a half. When you're creating the belly button, do you sew it from the inside or the outside? 
Um, so, so we have to release the belly button when we do the tongue and tuck so that we can lift up the skin um, and do that, you know, and dissect all the way to the cyphoid, which is this little bony prominence we have here at the bottom of our sternum, okay? And then we stretch everything down and then we have to create a new opening for that belly button to come out. And so then we put stitches just on the inside there to try to hide them just in, the, in that fold so they're not too obvious, you know, from the outside. All right, and we try to do that you know, in a nice way. Now, unfortunately, if you do have a tendency to keloid, um, the belly button is one of the areas where it does tend to keloid, unfortunately. So we do have to take care of the belly buttons. Um, we do have to use the scar creams on there religiously. Um, and if you feel like they're keloiding, you know, hit them with some steroids such as Kenalog to try to you know, prevent them from being too noticeable. Um, the other thing you can do with the belly button is you can do some what we call belly button training. So about two weeks post-op or so after some initial healing, um, you can use like a little marble or, or you actually, they actually sell them commercially with a belly button trainer um, or a cotton ball. You can put that inside the belly button to make sure it stays nice, a nice inny um, as well. Okay? All right. So, all right. Post-op care. All right. I mentioned the drains. There's two drains. Okay. We teach you how to empty them. Uh, once there's less than 25 cc's in 24 hours, it means that drain is ready to come out. So we typically use two drains, one snakes across the bottom, one comes across the top. The one across the top is usually the one that is ready first. That's usually the one that we can get out here before you go back home. And then the other one is that the one that comes out a little bit later, anywhere between seven and 10 or sometimes 14 days. And it's the one that you have to prepare for to remove at home, okay? While you have your drains in place, you're gonna be wearing an abdominal binder, okay? It's basically a white wrap that comes all the way around you. Um, that binder will stay on until both drains come out. So is it a specific date? No, it's just until both drains come out. And when does, when do the drains come out? When it's less than 25 cc's in 24 hours. That's right. You got it. Okay. All right. So both drains come out. You can switch from a binder to a faja type garment. Okay. Faja type garment, you're going to wear pretty much uh, 24 seven for the first six weeks. So you can, then you're going to come down to 12 hours a day. Uh, for the next six weeks until you get to the three month mark. At the three month mark, it varies a lot. Some patients are happy there and their swellings come down and, they just, and they're tired of the faja and they're done with it. Other patients have some residual swelling, especially in that kind of lower central portion. And they still have to continue to wear the faja for 12 hours a day um, for another couple months or so. In a tummy tuck, it is not unusual, not unusual to have to wear compression sometimes six months, sometimes nine months, it's not unusual, okay? It can happen for certain patients, especially in that central portion, like I'm saying, which is the most dependent portion of the body and tends to have the most swelling, okay? All right, um, when can you get active again? Six weeks, so the first six weeks, no heavy lifting, no strenuous activity, no swimming or submerging the body in their water, okay? At the beginning, you're gonna walk a little hunched over like this because everything feels so tight, especially that muscle repair. By about day seven to 10, then that's when you're gonna start walking a bit more straight again, all right? And so definitely at the beginning, you wanna sleep either in a recliner or you wanna have a bed with a couple pillows in the back, a couple pillows underneath your legs to kind of relieve some of that tension, okay? And as you start getting to about 10 days, two weeks, you start to walk more straight, but you still can't do any strenuous activity or heavy lifting until you get to six weeks. After six weeks, then yes, you can go start going back to the gym, you can start swimming, you can start being more active at that time. When can you okay. start your lymphatic massages? Great question. Uh, and uh, thank you for that. I even forgot to put it on the board. Uh, so massage, okay. So the, tummy, the massages for tummy tuck are not the same as massages for uh, lipo or BBL, okay? So you can start with massage you know, the, what I call the early massages, you know, sooner the next day, but those massages are gonna focus on the flanks and the waist where we did the lipo, and believe it or not, on the lower back. Now you may ask, why the lower back? You didn't do any surgery there. Well, because for that same reason that I said they're gonna be walking hunched over like this, you develop, you know, some muscular pain in the lower back, and so the massage can relieve that pain and make you feel better. All right, that's gonna be for the first two weeks. That's the only massage you're gonna get. So, some massage to the flanks and the waist, and some massage to the lower back. After the initial healing time, after two weeks of initial healing time, once everything's looking okay, the incisions look okay, then you can go from you know, a more uh, you know, generalized lymphatic massage that includes the anterior abdomen as well. Okay? All right, and then the other thing that, I'm, oh, that, that always comes up, 
uh, and I put it here in the post up because it's, uh, people don't really know about it beforehand. Uh, if you only seen like, uh, like late um, follow-ups, you never see this phase. And that's what's called pleading, okay? Pleading um, is a term um, that I think they use for sewing. And when you do that, it's when, the, when, the, when, the, when you sew something and it's kind of like lumpy, bumpy, a little bit like this along the incision, okay? Pleading happens with tummy tucks very, very often, okay? Okay, it happens, I don't know, I would say most cases will have some degree of pleading. Pleading may not be the same on one side or the other. It's typically you see it more here along the sides, okay, along here and along here. Why is there pleating? Because we're trying to bring everything tight and everything towards the center to bring out that nice shape, okay? It's very common and you do not have to freak out about it. Do not worry about it because an overwhelmingly majority of the cases, I would say more than greater than 95% of the cases, after three months that pleating has gone away. Okay, it's just part of the procedure and part of the healing process. So if you see pleading, don't freak out. It happens to most people and it most likely will go away uh, for over 95% of people. Okay, all right. How does dog ears happen and how do you fix it? Okay, good. So that's a, that's a great segue. So because the next thing I was gonna talk about uh, was kind of Perfect. Some aftercare and then of course the complications. So dog ears not really a complication, but it can happen. That's typically when you when um, either through, you know, when at the, e at the end of the incision, uh, some of the skin there, uh, after things are healed and everything else, remains loose and it kind of pokes out a little bit, okay? And that's what's called the dog ear. Um, and that, you know, can potentially happen. We try to avoid it by trying to bring out that scar as far as we need to, to make things nice and smooth, okay? Uh, but sometimes because there is some initial swelling during the surgery, after three, four, or four months pass, uh, sometimes, you know, if, 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 the, if the patient doesn't have great skin elasticity, uh, sometimes then after all that heals, that uh, it can be a little pooch there uh, of skin, and we call that a dog ear, and then that has to get fixed. For the most part, it's typically an easy fix. You, just, uh, you can do that under local anesthesia. Just remove that little bit of excess skin, close it up, and you're good to go. Uh, but yeah, we do our best to try to avoid it, but trying to extend that incision as far as we can, trying to get things as tight as we can along the lateral edges, and doing some liposuction to the area as well to try to avoid the dog ears as best as we can. So okay. if a patient who's post-op tummy tuck and they don't like their scar, is there a way to go in and fix that or reduce the look? So again, so it, so it depends about timing. So initially, it's not no, thing, there's going to be pleading. It's not going to look great. You can't make you can't base a decision on like one week post op. Certainly not. Scar is going to change a lot in the first three to six months. Okay, um, but if it's been six months and and there's an issue with the scar, then yes, you can start considering uh, you know trying to change it. However, before then, of course, you want to do things to, to try to you get the best scar possible. So you want to do your, you want to use your silicon, okay, uh, or some sort of silicone-based scar cream uh, over that area. You want to massage the scars, all right, so try to make sure that they remain as uh, flat as possible. Uh, and then, of course, um, if you feel that there's a, a, some keloiding or hypertrophic scar, scar going on, you want to get, you know, point that out so that you can then get a steroid injection. So. Uh, if you're an in-town patient, we'll do that here ourselves. If you're out of town, typically a dermatologist is able to help you with that. Okay. Can someone with endometriosis get a tummy tuck done? Metri yeah, so endometriosis, fibroids, those are, those are all uterine problems, problems with the uterus. Those are deep, the uterus is deeper in the abdominal wall cavity, so it's, it's deep to the abdominal wall. A tummy tuck is, is everything that is above the abdominal wall, okay, or at the abdominal wall. So what is the abdominal wall? It's the muscles. All right, so you have your skin, you have your fat, you have your abdominal wall, um, and, and then we don't go any deeper to that, okay? All right, so now let's uh, touch upon the complications, okay? What are the potential complications from a tummy tuck? Well, of course, you know, any surgery you do, uh, you're making a big incision, you're doing a lot of undermining, you have potential for bleeding. Uh, that's why we always check your coags, make sure your coags are normal, and of course, we're very, very careful to cauterize all the little vessels as we move along, all right? Um, scarring, so scarring, we kind of touched upon it a little bit. There are people that have, that have a tendency to keloid or hypertrophic scar. We got to be very, very careful. We got to be on top of that scar. We got to be doing the scar creams, the silicone, and if need be, the steroid injections. Okay. Um, the next one I typically talk about is um, seroma. Seroma is probably one of the more common complications. So what is seroma? Seroma is fluid accumulation between the the skin flap that we that we just you know stretched down 
and the abdominal wall. Okay, and that's why you have the drains. So what are the, those are that's what the drains are for to minimize the risk of seroma, and that's why you don't want to remove them too soon. You want to wait till they're less than 25 cc's in 24 hours to really decrease that risk of seroma. But even if you do that, of course, the risk of seroma is never zero. It can potentially happen. It's not a big deal. It's not an emergency. It's not an urgency. Um, it can typically be dealt with very, very easily by doing what's called a needle aspiration. So just putting a little needle in the area, sucking out the fluid, putting on some compression. Sometimes you have to do this more than once, but eventually that seroma will go away. Okay? The other thing that's a little bit more common is open wounds. Sometimes you can get small areas of open wounds, especially in the central portion, because we are, you know, stretching down that skin. We are doing it under, uh, we're kind of closing it under some tension. Uh, we do expect that you kind of want to relieve that tension with the walking the way that I said, but, you know, because there is some tension, if there's like a stretch or, you know, something happens, potentially that wound can open up a little bit, and then we just have to treat the wound. How do we do that? Um, you know, it depends. If it's a small open wound, sometimes it's a little antibiotic ointment, it'll close up on its own. If it's a little bit bigger, sometimes we have to do what's called moist to dry dressing changes. Uh, and then if, God forbid, it's a large wound, uh, which happens extremely rare here. I don't remember the last time it happened uh, here. Uh, but it can happen. Uh, if that were to happen, then you would have to use a wound back uh, to close a larger wound. Okay? Alright, what is a wound back? Uh, it's basically a sponge. Um, that uh, has suction on it. So you, you put the sponge in the wound, you put a tape over that under suction, and then that allows the tissue to heal faster and the wound to close faster. Really quick, are the drains removed at your post-op appointment five days after? So like I said, typically one of them is, but the other one is usually not ready, so that has to be removed a bit later when it's ready, and so you have to prepare ahead of time and make sure you've identified someone that's not the ER, or not urgent care, you've identified someone else, that's gonna help you to remove that drain. Okay? Mm -hmm. uh, also, actually, I've done a video on how to remove the drain. It's probably kind of lost in our, we'll have to see where we, where, where we put it up so it's easy for you to find. Uh, but there's gonna be a video there on how to remove a drain. It's very easy, very straightforward. You guys can take a look at that as well. For patients okay. who have diabetes or high blood pressure that's under control, can they still have surgery? Yes, so if it's under control, that's the, those are the key words right there. So under control, you can definitely have surgery. So. Um, if you're on medication and that medication keeps your blood pressure okay, keeps your sugar levels okay, then you're good to go. Um, so what are we looking for? Blood pressure, we definitely don't want your diastolic above 100. Anyone who walks in here with a diastolic, which is the bottom number, blood pressure above 100 will get, uh, unfortunately, have to be postponed. Um, the other thing that we ask for for diabetics is the hemoglobin A1C. Uh, it's totally different than your hemoglobin level. I, I know it has a similar name at the beginning, but it's not the same thing. It's called hemoglobin A1C. That's for diabetics, and we check that to make sure that it's less than 6.5, okay? We want actually a low number on the hemoglobin A1C. We want it to be less than 6.5. Do you use Expirel? All right, yes, we do use Expirel. It is definitely available. Uh, what is Expirel? It's a medication. You can think of it similar to lidocaine, but it's long-acting. So I inject it at the time of the procedure. I can inject it along the muscle repair and along the incisions, and it'll provide great pain relief for the first 72 hours. Um, so I highly, highly recommend it. In fact, some patients are able to go from the Expirel strictly and then go straight to like uh, ibuprofen or something after 48 hours after surgery uh, or just Tylenol and not have to take any narcotics at all. Uh, so I definitely highly recommend the Expirel uh, for pain relief after surgery. Okay. All right. So we talked about uh, so seroma. Okay. Swelling. I mentioned that a bit. For some patients, it can be long term. So long term, meaning six months, nine months, you know, can take a while for some patients, okay? So it's not completely unusual. So if that's happening to you, you know, it's okay. Eventually it will go away. Um, but it can just, you can just be one of these patients where it just takes a while for it to go away, okay? All right. Okay, and now we start getting to kind of the scarier ones, okay? So the two scarier ones, one is skin necrosis. Necrosis means death. Uh, so skin death. Um, and that happens... Typically, if, this, if you're too aggressive and you pull things way too tight, it's a possibility. Or uh, in certain, you know, some surgeons, I don't do this, but in certain areas uh, or different countries, sometimes they'll do fairly aggressive liposuction uh, in combination with the tummy tuck, even in that central portion there. Um, and when you do that, the risk of uh, basically taking away some uh, blood supply to the skin and the skin dying is, is much greater. Uh, so I. I don't do that. I know there's some surgeons out there that do it and have a ton of experience and they do it very well. 
Uh, but there are some surgeons out there who do it, and unfortunately, I've seen some ugly air, uh, wounds caused by skin death or skin necrosis due to being too aggressive with that. So you want to be careful. Okay, please be careful. Make sure that you go to someone who really knows what they're doing. Okay, um, and then. You know what happens after skin necrosis? You have to cut out the the, the, the dead skin basically. If you're left with a big open wound, it typically does require a wound back uh, to fix it, and then you're left with a, a, a not very great looking scar. That's usually what happens there. Okay. What's the difference, in your opinion, between the tummy tucks with a drain and without? Okay, so so drain is tummy tucks. That you know that is a thing. It does exist. There's certain uh, physicians that like to do that. Um, how do you do that? Well. You still have that, you know. You still have to do that undermining. So you have to lift up the skin all the way to the cycle process, like we said. Uh, but then, when you lay everything down, you have to do what we, we call close the dead space. So you have to put multiple little sutures in there to, to close things down to try to not allow fluid to accumulate. Um, so it takes a lot longer, and there is also a bit of a higher risk of what we call contour deformities because if you don't put that stitch just right, you know things can look a little off. So I don't do it for those two reasons. Um, you know, I want to be efficient in the OR, and also I don't want to uh, have any potential contour deformities. Okay. Uh, okay. Another complication: uh, infection. Okay. Any any surgical procedure can have an infection, um, so we always treat you with antibodies before and after surgery to try to minimize that risk. Uh, typically, if you have an infection, it's usually along the incision, and we sometimes have to open it up a little bit, let the infection out, wash it out, and do those moisture dry dressing changes that we talked about. So that is a possibility. Another thing that sometimes happens is you can have what we call spitting sutures. Sometimes your body doesn't like some of the sutures that we put in there uh, under a little bit of tension and it starts to kind of push them out. Um, you can feel those sometimes. It gets a little red. Sometimes you can have a little bit of, um, you know, a little bit of pus around that area. Typically the solution is, is fairly straightforward, but you want to open up the area, remove that suture, wash out the area, and then just treat it with other antibiotic ointments or those moisture dry dressing changes, and it typically then will just heal over. Okay, all right, and then the big one, the big, big one that we are always trying to prevent is DVTs and PEs, okay, deep vein thrombosis and pulmonary embolus. These are blood clots, okay. Uh, with any surgery under general anesthesia, you're at risk for a DVT and PE. Um, it's a little bit higher with a, a tummy tuck as compared to, say, just a breast dog. Uh, so we want to be very, very careful. You do have to do your walking. Walking is extremely important, okay? You wanna be up and walking at least 10 minutes every hour while awake after the surgery so that you can maintain the circulation and the legs moving uh, and prevent the potential for blood clots forming, okay? If you're having a long flight, anything uh, longer than three hours after surgery, I highly, highly recommend that you get a, what's called a sequential compression device. It's a little kind of boots that you wrap around the leg that kind of squeeze and let go, squeeze and let go. They keep the circulation moving. They greatly decrease the risk of a, of a blood clot. Actually, it's, 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 several studies have demonstrated that the, the decreased risk from that is the same as injecting you with a blood thin, a thinner such as Lovenox. So that's why that is my preference and not giving the Lovenox, which of course has the side effect of potentially causing bleeding. So the boots will never cause bleeding, obviously, they're just little boots, but they decrease the risk of blood clots just as much. So I recommend them highly uh, uh, for you. Okay, all right, so I think that's pretty comprehensive there. So let's step over here to the, uh, our new section. And we did it once and we're gonna continue to do it. Uh, and it's called The Real Deal. The Real Deal with Dr. Alex Earl, okay? So what is the real deal with tummy tuck, okay? Real deal with tummy tuck in the state of Florida. By the Department of Health, you're only limited to one liter of, of uh, fat removal via liposuction, okay? Someone tells you otherwise, they're not following the rules, all right? Those are the rules that are written for office-based surgery here in Florida. That's the real deal. All right, tummy tuck. It is not a procedure for visceral fat. All right, here we go. My super raw drawing here. Uh, are we able to see that there on yes. the screen? Okay. This is kind of like, like my Homer Simpson type drawing, the big belly, all right? You got your skin, you got your fat, okay? Uh, which is between the skin and the muscle. That's the fat that if we were doing liposuction, that's the fat that we can get with the liposuction. Then you have your muscle, okay? Your abdominal wall. And then deep to that are your organs, all right? That's where your stomach is, your liver, your large intestine, your small intestine, your pancreas, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, visceral fat lives with the organs. Visceral fat is in here, okay? 
There is no, so tummy tuck does not fix the visceral fat. Liposuction does not fix the visceral fat. The only thing that can fix the visceral fat is diet and exercise. That's it. There is no plastic surgery procedure to fix visceral fat, all right? So if you have a big belly, and the belly is big because of visceral fat, then you have to do diet and exercise to reduce that belly. You're not gonna go flat, flat. You're not gonna go flat, flat if you have a lot of visceral fat, okay? All right, so tummy tuck is not a procedure for visceral fat. All right, um, the central area, okay? I just basically briefly, so this central area, I t which is this triangle here, I typically do not suction. I may suction a little bit in that, in that little line there, where I wanna create a nice little line there, but that's it, all right? I don't suction the fat in this area because like I just mentioned, the risk of skin necrosis goes way up, okay? Um, so if, if the expectation is that this area is going to be liposuction, then that's not, at least not for me, for pure, that's not, can't be the realistic expectation. We focus our liposuction to the flanks and the waist during that procedure. And if you need that liposuction, then you may have to come back for a liposuction procedure three to four months afterwards. Okay. High BMIs. If your BMI is high, probably say, I don't know, 30, 32, 33.5, which is our max. Okay. Yes the tummy tuck will remove the excess skin, okay, but it's not gonna like, quote unquote, snatch you if your BMI is, is, is very high. So if you're doing a tummy tuck, it's always best to lose the weight first. Lose the weight first and then do your tummy tuck. Similarly, oh, with uh, pregnancy. Yeah, you don't wanna do a tummy tuck and then get pregnant, okay? So uh, you wanna kind of think you're done with, you know, with um, having kids uh, before, you, or before you do your tummy tuck because that's just gonna ruin all the results of the tummy tuck. Um, afterwards, okay? All right, so so high BMI, you know, you, you gotta watch out for that. And like I said, it is very likely, it's very possible that you want, you'll want to do some liposuction afterwards, okay? Combining the two procedures, separated out by, you know, three to four months, um, is very common and usually gives you the best results. So you can, you know, depending on how much skin lax it is, you can do it, you know, a lot of times, um, if, if you're not thinking BBL, or we're just thinking tummies and lipo, then we'll do the tummy tuck first, and you'll come back three or four months later, we'll do that liposuction at that time then, because we're only doing lipo, then our limit goes up to four liters, and then yes, we can address that central abdominal portion, we can address the, the flanks and the waist again, we can do, you know, a little bit more there as needed, and then of course we can address the entire back, and do like an entire lipo 360, uh, which the back is not addressed at all uh, during just a tummy tuck procedure since you're laying on your back, okay? All right, so that's the real deal. It's not unusual, okay, that you may want to come back three to four months later and have a lipo uh, suction procedure. So you can't do those at the same time? That's what I'm saying. <laughs> yes, all right. So if you do it at the same time in the state of Florida, uh, then you're limited to the one liter of uh, fat removal, which is not a lot. Typically, we can get that just in the flanks and the waist. Okay, unless, I mean, the only exceptions would be like, like very low BMI patients. If your BMI is 22 or 21 and you have a lot of loose skin because you have three pregnancies and you just want to like with in certain areas and you're not going to get to a liter, then yes, you know, because you're, you're starting off with a low, you know, BMI of 22, 21, maybe 23 or so. But it's certainly not going to be the case if your BMI is 28 or 29. You're going to have much more than one liter. Uh, you're actually going to be at that four liter limit around then. And so then you're going to have to separate out the procedures. And if your BMI is higher than that, 30, 32, 33.5, you have more than four liters typically for most patients. Um, and so you may need, you know, a few rounds to really get to where you want to be unless you lose some of that weight first. Okay. So it's the same things to think about, you know, are you going to have a tummy tuck and then lipo uh, and then a BBL? It's a possibility and you can combine these things. Uh, but we have to stay within the limits given to us. Okay. All right, and I think the, the only other thing that I, I drew out here, my, my very crude drawing that I forgot to talk about, was this here. I just wanted to show what the, the muscle repair was about. Um, it's really called the plication. I, I'm not sure why the, how the term muscle repair came about. It's a little bit of a misnomer. We're not actually repairing any muscles, but we're actually what we're doing is we're bringing them in together. So with, with weight gain or pregnancies, the muscles, which are supposed to be side by side, which are these two what we call rectus, abdominal rectus muscles, um, get, get separated out and then you have this kind of space in between them 
that uh, is technically called a diastasis, okay? So when we do the muscle repair, we put a big, a big stitch inside and we bring this edge close to this edge again. And we bring all that close together the way that it was before, you know, pregnancies or massive weight gain or things of that nature, okay? So that's what the muscle repair does. Now, diastasis is not the same as a hernia, okay? Hernias are different. You can repair hernias, hernias at the time of tummy tuck, and it's pretty common for me to repair a small hernia or umbilical hernia, belly button umbilical hernia during a tummy tuck. Uh, so it's usually a hernia around the belly button area. Sometimes it can be above or below the belly button area. Those are called ventral hernias. All right. In a hernia, there's actually a hole, basically, in, in this in this in this tissue here, where the where the, the you know the stuff that's inside the belly wants to kind of pop through that abdominal wall. That's a real hernia when it's popping through the abdominal wall, as opposed to diastasis where it's just weak, but nothing's popping through, okay? So if you have a hernia, it's popping through the abdominal wall, and, we can, and, and for like a small, maybe even a medium hernia, we can fix it at that time. Not a large hernia though, that you probably have to want to get fixed beforehand, okay? All right, so I hope that clears that up. We have a question. Yep. I want a BBL and a tummy tuck. I have three kids, I have loose skin and fat. Which should I do first? Okay, so that's always, that's always a, a common question, you know, what, what should we do first, the BBL or tummy tuck? And so there's, there's no cookie cutter answer, okay? I'm, not, I'm never gonna say always do this first, uh, and it really depends on the patient. So, you know, what I need from you is, of course, I need to see your, your questionnaire, and I need to see your photos, um, and then talk a little bit about your goals, and then based on that, we can determine what we should do first. But in broad strokes, in general terms, if you have a lot of skin laxity, it's like really loose, then it's probably better to remove that excess skin first, do the tummy tuck first, then come back and do the BBL. If the skin is not that loose, actually, some, you know, we may not even be sure that you, you're, you're totally gonna need a tummy tuck afterwards, then it's best to do the BBL first and then see how you look at three to four months, and see whether you're happy with that skin or not. And if you're not, then come back and do the tummy tuck. Okay. Skin, it, it depends on the degree of skin laxity and, how, and the quality of that skin, all right? It, typically skin that has been stretched out for a long time, that has a lot of stretch marks, um, is not a great quality skin and doesn't bounce back as well as, uh, as skin that doesn't, you know, that doesn't have those factors. But like I said, every patient can be very, very different. So, but it is, you know, um, we're going to do one of these comprehensive overviews of BBL, uh, but one of the issues potentially with BBL is that is you know not having not didn't have that great uh, bounce back on the skin. Um, you know there's some skin laxity there that makes it look like not even because the skin is, is not tight. And so typically when that happens, the solution is a skin tightening procedure. So uh, if it's mild to moderate, that can be body tight. But if it's a bit more severe, then that would be a tummy tuck. Okay, and then we're, we're back to this talk here, tummy tucks. All right, all right, everybody. So I think that was pretty comprehensive. Um, we kind of really, really went through everything related to that uh, and we're able to answer a lot of great questions. So, like we said, we're excited. By the, by the next uh, hump day, we're gonna be back in action. So we're really, really excited about that. All right, so I will see everybody next Wednesday for Hump Day with Dr. Alex Earl. Take care, ciao.